Welcome to Rugby Saturday Southwest. I'm joined today by Jamie Schwabach and Carl Hawkins as always. Uh, so let's jump right into it. Jamie, you're the director for New Mexico Youth Rugby. You've been on the show a couple of times. So let's talk a little bit about the season uh, that we've had this last season. Uh, so how many teams did we have participating this year? You know, this year we had a really strong participation. We had both a men's and girls bracket, or a boys and a girls bracket. We had a boys 15s and a girls 7s, and then we also had a boys 10s bracket. And that's the second year that we've now had a boys 10 bracket, which we really found helpful to have that level of participation. So in total, we had just under 20 teams. Okay. And we were talking before, all New Mexico had a little bit of a decline in uh, participation, but we were able to keep all of those teams throughout the entire season, correct? Correct. So we did see a decrease in participation on the contact, contact high school side. We saw about a flat level play on the youth side, though, which is great. Hopefully we can increase those numbers. We're really looking for a strong number of participation from the Rio Rancho, New Mexico area, as well as Las Cruces. We did have some resurgence of some teams this year, which is excellent. We had some teams from El Paso come back on the boys side and then we also had a brand new team up in Las Vegas New Mexico from the World College from Montezuma come in this year which was exciting yeah, it's too bad they couldn't stick around for the final but I'm the, sure the kids had testing you know their academics come first which was really great to see but their level of play was really strong they represented more than 13 countries and came oh, in wow. and played together and, and had a really strong level of play and might also explain how they were so Dominant. I mean, they lost. They didn't lose any games this season, from what they I remember. They did. They lost one. Okay. And it was um, it was a, a still a strong competitive game. But what it was great to watch them play, though, because they also spoke so many different languages. So watching mm -hmm. some of our kids who are native New Mexicans, they're like, we're used to hearing Spanish and English on the field, <laughs> but you throw in French, they all were a little bamboozled. So. Which is little, exciting. That little college up there is a real gem, isn't it? It's, it's been around here now for, it must be 30, 30 years, mm -hmm. 35 years. I'm not sure how long it's been around. Doug Arnwine, who's the head coach for the Montezuma team, came in this year, came in with great support from his school, and the kids really loved it. He's created a really strong program. He was working with the boys there, and he also had a few girls, and so we were able to incorporate those girls in with some of our girls' side teams. They played with uh, the Los Alamos Bombshells this year. All right. Do, do they have any affiliation with the the uh, uh, Dickie Green's uh, uh, team up at the uh, Highlands? You know, the Highland team, which has done so dominant in the sevens bracket and the college circuit, some of those athletes have been coming out to help, and which is just great for a high school athlete to be able to see a top-level playing college athlete yeah, come so out cool, that incorporation. Huh? Oh, yeah. So really it's really good. great to see that such a small town, there's so much good rugby coming in from Las Vegas. So with the girls' side, I know we talked about it earlier in the year, but we did the or you did the girls' rumbles this year. Uh, how did you see that affect the girls and just the level of play that they had? You know, this year it was incredible. We were able to, to create a north and a south bracket for our, our level for the girls. And so the girls would come into Albuquerque one weekend, have a weekend off, then go south, have a weekend off, go north. So all the teams traveled. They mitigated the amount of travel, but they had an increased number of games they played in the season. So they played more than 19 games this season. So oh, yeah. by the time we came to the playoffs and state finals, we saw such a high level of play on the girls' side. We were seeing quicker plays, um, better tackles, more field vision. You were watching such a development from the opening season to the end. It was really incredible to see. What are the venues that they're playing at? We still dominated throughout New Mexico is in at Balloon Fiesta Park, which was a great partnership. Yet again, we were able to have all the youth as well as the high school club and college out there. So that was our main venue. When they were in, they also went to um, Los Alamos, which they were using the school football field as well as um, Las Cruces on the NMSU rugby pitch and then up in Farmington, and, and that's at a city park. So we had pretty big events in four different locations. Correct. And centralized here. And when they do that, they'd always have four girls teams come together, and often it was also in conjunction that's with a boys team, too. So you'd be having rugby from 9, 10 in the morning till 2 or 3, followed by a club or college game throughout the state. So those are those are like events that can be developed in those separate locations Correct. over time, and you get a little tradition going there. Mm -hmm. huh? And it was really great. We're still seeing such a strong level on the social side on the girls especially you get three four teams together and they're still having that great social and so towards the end of the season where you're seeing that true rugby spirit where you're seeing the level of, of play but then you're also having that camaraderie off the field which is so important 
I noticed at the beginning of the season you had a split, so some girls were up north, some girls were down south mm -hmm. playing. Is that something you plan on doing again next season, or more of the everybody come together, have one big event? So they did do, we had two weekends mm -hmm. that all the girls were in Albuquerque. So we did have opportunities. What we wanted to do was that the teams that always had to travel, so our Las Cruces slash El Paso teams, as well as our San Juan Farmington area teams, mm -hmm. we wanted them to be able to host so they didn't have to travel as much. And so in the end, all the teams throughout the league traveled similar amounts of time. Okay. So we, we plan to continue that as well. You know, this was a coach's decision. They wanted to create this rumble. So it was a drive from the coaches and the athletes, which was great. And did the girls really like playing those games, being able to watch? I noticed, especially the Rio Rancho girls, because they had their boys' team playing with them, in between their matches, they were able to go out, cheer. Uh, I know a few of the videos we used for this, you could hear the girls screaming, you're going to do sprints. You're going right. to really <laughs> hyping up their boys. So is that something that some of these other girls teams are going to be able to do in the future as well? Totally. We also saw that. We did see that with the Rio Rancho team, which is great. The Royals, as well as the Rebels, they, they have a really tight cohesion out in Rio Rancho. Up in San Juan, with the boys and girls teams up there, same thing. I love it that anytime there's a high tackle on either the boys' side or the girls' side, Everybody has to, to do a little extra work at Monday practice, and I really like that cohesion. We did, however, how it wound up working with the playoffs on the boys' tens and the girls, we did wind up having some overlap, and so next season we want to make sure that there's never an overlap during any of our state championship games. What do you mean overlap? There was a, the girls were playing when the boys were playing from San oh. Juan at the oh, same time okay. with how it advanced, which was so unfortunate. Is San Juan one team from up there? Yeah. It is. They're from, you know, they're pulling from Pedro Vista and Aztec as well, as well as Farmington High. And, and the they also have a lot of homeschool athletes. They've got a really strong program developing up is that in, right? in San yeah, Juan. Their, their girls were absolutely dominant this year. They, they didn't really lose were. a single game, and their closest game they still won by, I think, four points or so. But we'll continue this conversation in just a moment, folks. Stick around.
Welcome back to Rugby Saturday Southwest. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the officials and the athletic trainers. So this year there was an increase in referees that you had. What was the effect of having more I guess bodies on the field. You know, it was great. We had a lot of new individuals who came in to become refs, but we need more. We always need more qualified refs. So we had a certification course early in the season, had a lot of new folks come in, and a lot of them were coaches. And we saw that, especially as, as you mentioned with the rumble on the girls' side, we saw more games. So we need more referees. So throughout the season, we did have them. This year, we also had more possibilities of trained assistant refs on the side. And at all of our championship matches for the boys' 15s, boys' 10s, and girls' 7s, we were actually able to have a full squad. So we had our center refs, our ARR refs, we had somebody who was checking in subs, as well as in both tri, tri zones, which was just really spectacular to have a full team. So we saw an increased level. We still have a, a long way to go in terms of needing more individuals, and we'll be hosting another referees course this September, as well again in early spring. So always looking for more. In terms of athletic trainers, USA Rugby on the high school and youth side for contact games has um, implemented a policy in terms of having medical professionals in the fields. So EMTs are athletic trainers, with athletic trainers being the preference. We were very fortunate that every one of our games in New Mexico, post our opening season tournament, we had an athletic trainer in the field, which is great. great. In terms of in New Mexico, we can diagnose a concussion, we can prevent injuries, we can have the taping, but we're also having somebody who's sport specific watching the entire game, which was incredible for our athletes, our coaches, as well as our parents, and all for the concern of the safety of our athletes. So. You know, that assistant referee um, uh, course that you're having and the fact that the assistant referees are there and it's not just the teams picking mm -hmm. somebody randomly off the sideline that'll run with the flag, that's really an, a key to improving the play and identifying uh, any sort of... Uh, uh, miscreant activity that might be occurring and helping right. the referee out and that's something that, that I think that parents should be encouraged to go get trained and participate in it. It's an interesting way to get to really know the game mm -hmm. and to help to make sure that the policing of the game is done in the most efficient way possible. No, it's a great point. I think it's a great opportunity for parents to come in, take that referee course, learn a little bit more about the game and then step in as an assistant referee. You know, Our referees, most of them, most of the work they do is all volunteer and and that's something incredible. When you were looking at every Saturday from September on, we were having games from 8 or 9 in the morning until 3 or 4 in the afternoon. That's a lot of work and a yeah, lot of dedication. It would be nice to have a roster of, of yeah. certified assistant referees, huh? I do have to say, though, I mean, our referee levels in New Mexico, we are really blessed to have a great group of referees who dedicated a lot of their time this season yeah, we, to we the are. high school, club, really and are. college. But we different. definitely need more. And we also need more education opportunities for our coaches and our refs because there's always room for improvement. Yeah. So how many games do you think each ref officiates during a weekend or during a, the whole season? You know, during a weekend, we really try to keep it minimal. You know, it depends, uh, one to three. In some cases, the sevens games, they might be doing more. more. A lot. Our, our refs worked really hard, especially with these rumbles where you're looking, where they're refing. I don't, I don't know. I'd have to recount those numbers and look at the data mm -hmm. in terms of it. And we have different levels of refs, you know, who's oh, yeah. qualified to, to ref a men's match or a college match or a sevens or a tens match. And so they need more games to increase their level to ref those higher level games. I did notice during the playoffs, the two referees you had for up in Santa Fe were the same guys who were refereeing when I was back in high school, back six years ago mm -hmm. or so so definitely see those the people who are qualified still being in the game too is pretty important they yeah, are they, they love it I mean you gotta love it to do it I mean because you get, you get harassed and everything else and <laughs> it's, a, it's not an easy job to be a good referee and you really have to appreciate those guys but I think that's really important too it's just like the level of refereeing we do need to improve always um, but a referee controls the game and controls the flow of the game and also is going to to watch out and make sure the game is safe on all levels. So, yeah. such no one, an important. No role. one's harder on the refs than me, though. I really <laughs> have to bite my tongue sometimes. <laughs> Kaminsky's run me off a few times. <laughs> um, one of the things, another interesting thing that uh, that I noticed when when we were uh, broadcasting regularly last season, uh, every weekend out there, the the parents would just like 
kind of surround us so that because their familiarity of the game was really poor and they didn't know mm -hmm. what was going on and when he and I were calling the games they would just come sit next to us and thank us and they, they didn't you know they were getting to learn the game mm -hmm. uh, and I guess uh, uh, they don't take advantage of watching the game on television or the other sort of things there are but having that that kind of d open discussion there I think really uh, it really seemed to impact them I was kind of flattered by the fact that look at this we <laughs> were being surrounded I think that's a good point though I know every time I've been on the sidelines watching the games and you talk to parents you're like hey do you know what's going on and they don't and you just kind of coach them through it what what a try is, how much is that worth, how offsides work when you go to a scrum and all of our referee calls, it is really beneficial. And the more we can educate our parents and our fans, the more people are going to come out and support. And we had really strong showing at Balloon Fiesta this year where we were able to keep track of the number of, of fans. And every weekend we had hundreds and hundreds of people out there and it was great just to support this game. Yeah, so, yeah. It's incredible. How big was the crowd for that state finals uh, weekend? You know, we had probably 850 to 1,000 people out there oh, for wow. that state out at Balloon Fiesta Park. Mm -hmm. And that's including athletes, fans, and of course that's only the people who came through our gate. So if they came through someplace else, we might not have had those numbers in our totals. But we saw such a great level of fans this season and, and participation, so, which is cool. Build, 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 huh? Yeah, and we definitely, just with regards to that, we always need to work on, on the culture of rugby, too, and that rugby is a sport where it is an athlete-based sport, but whatever happens on the field after that, it's done. There's no mention of it, and it doesn't need to ever resurface. So that's something we still need to work on with our fans to change that level of understanding as well. Okay. Well, are there any plans for the growth in the next coming years? And we're looking for an increased number of participants. We're always looking for more coaches, more athletes, and more players. Um, and more and more coaches would be great as we offer more education for them as well. This next six months, we're really going to do a strong drive on fundraising so that we can help support new teams and current teams already in existence. Okay. So you mentioned the need for coaches. How would somebody go into coaching if maybe they like rugby, they're a little bit interested, and they want to get involved? Well, there's so many great opportunities for coaching. So just by taking an L100 course, which is online, it's just a basic coaching course to get you familiar with the game, some concussion training, some things along those lines. And that's all through usaRugby.org under coaching. We'll also be hosting a course in the early spring, and that's mm -hmm. going to be an L200, which we do require for all contact levels. They can also just reach out to me, and I can get them involved at NewMexicoYouthRugby at gmail.com. Okay. Well, uh, I, in earlier discussion, you were mentioning that some certain teams are lacking coaching, some have it. Is there any opportunities for maybe some of those teams missing a few people to get them from some places where they have a lot of coaching, a lot of experience? You know, there's coaches are pretty loyal to their teams, and that's something that's really beautiful. You know, these coaches are volunteers. They're spending time and dedication to a program that they're working on developing. Some of those coaches are stepping up. You know, Rio Rancho has a really strong level of coaches, and they had a lot more coaches trained this year, and then they took those coaches, and they're coaching on the youth side as well. So there's always opportunities for coaches to come in and get involved, but there's also opportunities for new teams to form. So. Okay. Yeah, I heard several um, several uh, different interviews and players that we've had on the show recently talking about um, the presence of, of uh, uh, coaches from the higher levels from you know like Tom Goslow goes out and recruits like crazy out there in mm -hmm. Rio Rancho and those guys and, and uh, I think that that presence of these highly trained coaches mm -hmm. uh, uh, and um, assisting uh, uh, coaches that might not be so experienced or even the experience Experienced coaches and in, in uh, giving um, uh, the, um, the the whole picture of the opportunity uh, mm -hmm. from a coach's level really increases the amount of participation too. I yeah. totally agree. We do. I mean, we were discussing that we have a lot of L300 coaches, um, and UNM is really blessed to have a really strong, dynamic lineup of, of coaches on the men's side as well as on the women's side with high level of play um, at the coaching side as well as the athletic side. And you're right. Having those coaches come out to a practice, help you guide a practice, is going to make you a better player. Oh, yeah. I, I can remember all kinds of uh, college and, and um 
in club sports where a co when a college, I mean high school in club sports, when a college coach showed up, man, it was like a big day. Hey, the college coach is here, man. I could maybe it's I like could play in college. Steps up your game every time. Oh yeah, yes. But up we're up your also game. seeing <laughs> there's more opportunities for athletes to get a scholarship for rugby That's now. That's right. You're seeing That's more right. programs coming in and offering kids money. You know, we did have some. I don't have those numbers. We have had some um, of our seniors who are going on to college and they're playing rugby and that's awesome because they're getting their college and their education and they're still continuing the sport yeah. which is something our whole goal let's get a kid a ball and a rugby or a rugby ball in a kid's hand and get them to play but let's see him play youth let's play him, see him play contact tackle and then high school college and then on to club side and let's see them on the national side see them at USA rugby levels well that would be very exciting well we'll pick this conversation right back up in just a moment folks stick around Garden Sorts Team Sales is a proud supporter of ProView Sports Network. Get into the game. Garden Schwartz Team Sales features fine products and apparel from Wilson, Shutt Sports, Speedline, and Russell Athletics. We offer custom embroidery and screen printing services for all of your school or club needs, from team uniforms to school letter jackets. Specializing in all sports and serving all communities, from big schools to small schools, from up north to down south, or all points in between. Garden Schwartz Team Sales, for great prices, friendly staff, and quality products, call Garden Schwartz Team Sales today at one 800 880-7767. That's 1-800-880-7767. Since 1939, Garden Schwartz Team Sales is a proud supporter of New Mexico Youth Athletics. Don't forget, every ProView Network sporting event is on sale at our DVD store. Go to www.proviewnetworks.com to buy your DVD today. Terry Cosper Insurance Agency is a proud partner with ProView Networks and a proud supporter of New Mexico High School Athletics. Terry has been a local farmer's agent for over 20 years for auto, home, life, and business insurance. Just like high school sports are important, so are teen drivers. For more information, call Terry or one of his licensed staff members at 898-5556. Quotes are available for you. Altitude Sports Grill is where Albuquerque's sports fans won't miss a game. With locally crafted brews on tap and refreshingly crisp cocktails. Located in Hotel Cascada, Albuquerque residents find a staycation worth staying for. Catching Lobo Sports, enjoying a beer on the beach, or wiping out, Hotel Cascada is home to your urban adventure. Affordable guest rooms, no hassle water park parties, and much more. supporter of ProView Sports Network. Are you sure we're supposed to be doing this? Don't worry, I've watched him do it a thousand times. Come on, what's the worst that can happen? No, bad dog. Hi, welcome to Car Crafters. What happened? Don't worry, we'll make it like it never happened. Car Crafters, it's like it never happened. <laughs> Before we update you folks on what's going on in the world, Jamie, for high school athletes around New Mexico, how do they get involved with college recruiting or playing at the next level in club? You know, one of the best ways is to reach out to their coaches. You can always just reach out to us on our website as well at NewMexicoYouthRugby.org. Uh, we can always get them in contact. Another great resource here is at UNM. For the boys' side is Tom Goslow, and on the girls' side is going to be Maria Clifton. What's her name? Clifton. Maria? And she's, um, she's been coaching with UNM for a long time. She came out of the program, worked really hard there, and is continuing as the head coach with the UNM team. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get you updated uh, on the scores going around. Let's start in the United States with the club competitions. So well, that first we can do D1, that. Austin appeared in the uh, D1 championships again, but this time it wasn't the Austin Blacks. No, those Austin Blacks were tremendous when we got to watch them in Tucson, weren't they? Yeah. Um, they were uh, uh, 
defeated in the in the finals out there, the Sweet 16. But the, what a what a team! Uh, this time it was the Huns, mm -hmm. and that was it's the first time in 40 years as a 40 year old club they won the national championship. And I didn't get a chance to see the game, but they defeated New York Athletic Club, who are a six time winner and um, they uh, beat always the have a strong Blacks team. Two years ago, so. The Huns were able to avenge Texas a little bit. That's right. And in, in the, on the women's side, the Gladiatrix uh, beat the Raleigh Venom. Uh, I didn't see that game either, well, but they are the national champions. They're the national champions, but the team's stocked with women's Eagles players. You know, more than one of them started in that Canadian series. So it's going to be a tough team to beat moving forward. I think very few teams could could even keep up with them this year. That 30, 39 to 17 victory was one of the closest margins for them all season long. Oh, wow. Well, you know, that's the way you win national championships. You yeah. put a bunch of national players on your team. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a proven tactic. In Division Two, Life Atlanta beat the St. Louis Bombers. Uh, St. Louis Bombers actually prevented the only time the Aardvarks uh, uh, had an opportunity to uh, win a Division I U.S. championship. They eliminated oh, them in the semifinals. Uh, our good buddy Marty Watts uh, <laughs> played in that game. And then on the women's side, we had the uh, Cilia from Milwaukee beat uh, the San Francisco Golden Gate uh, women for that. And that was a super close match the whole time. Oh, yeah. It was... They never really got further ahead than about five points, except for at the very beginning when it was eight to zero. But after um, Golden Gate caught up, it was tight the whole way through, like 12-10. And then at the very end, it was won by a penalty kick that kept them just out of range with a 16 to 15 victory that Definitely one of the best games of uh, that whole weekend. Well, you know, the, th the thing that I really, you know, uh, well, let's hit Division Three first, and then let me make a summary statement. In Division Three, the St. Louis Royals beat Bremer County, um, and, and you were indicating that that game was uh, hotly contested, it was, too. It was definitely an interesting game to watch. Uh, the pace of play was a little bit tough because of penalties and yellow cards, but it was definitely something to watch. Um, that way. When I when I look at the this this piece of paper that where I wrote down all of these teams that won these di different um, um, divisions and for the national championship, the thing that hits you is how diversified it is. Where they're from, all over the country, Virginia, Gladiatrix. Where they're from. Um, uh, California. From California, from California, there's only one Cali well, Golden Golden Gate was uh, another California team. But a lot of times we have this domination from certain parts of the country, and it's really getting spread out. Life in Atlanta, the St. Louis having two teams. That was it's phenomenal to think that St. Louis has two teams because they about usually Milwaukee. Yeah, Milwaukee. Oh, it's it's good stuff. New York Athletic Club always being there. You got a huge population center with a lot of internationals and stuff that always play for the New York Athletic Club. Uh, well, as we see this level of play, though, do you feel we're going to do better on the international circuit? Well, because this is going to feed into our programs. It is. It is indeed. Um, I I don't know how it can't help. I really don't. Um, but I think that there's an issue with the way that U.S. rugby deals with the club rugby and how they select and where they get their players from and the process that they use. And it's not just U.S. Uh, you, you go to any country and they're always complaining about the national organization and how they don't know how to pick the right team and they never get the best players and there's all kinds of politics and all. That, that stuff prevails but there's no reason uh, that the United States men's rugby is number 17 in the world. There's no reason we're behind Romania, Italy, Samoa, Tonga, Georgia, Japan, Fiji, Argentina, Wales. You know, we have 330 million people People in this country and fantastic athletes and so the the idea that we can't put together you know 25 great athletes that know how to play rugby and can compete on, on the highest level uh, it, it, it doesn't make sense well they definitely have moved up I mean we won the America's Cup this year actually we've moved down we, we were higher up I mean but. we've we've done some good we've done some good stuff but it just isn't uh, it hasn't gelled. It really. And I mean, look at Scotland, number five. What does Scotland have? Like, 
maybe 40 million people at the most. They've got three uh, population centers in Gla uh, Glasgow, Edinburgh, and in uh, the two main ones, Glasgow and Edinburgh. And they are like competing. They're number five in the world now. They're uh, in the Six Nations. They were just really strong. Well, they and also have that a league in very close to them where they can compete beyond the club. Uh, our D1 teams did have multiple U.S. Eagles on the team, but there's not a league that they can really play professionally in, so it makes it a little bit more difficult for them. Yeah, that's true. And we're spread out and we're far apart and you don't have to like drive, you know, three miles for your match and stuff like that. And as we know very well here in New Mexico. Yeah. The other thing to point out is the USA women are number eight right now. And that's kind of a, a disappointment for them, I think, to a certain degree. They're behind Spain, uh, Australia, Ireland, France and Canada now. Canada uh, is producing yeah. some great rugby. They their, are. Their team, I think we were mentioning just a minute ago, uh, last year's D1 women's team, Seattle, moved to Canada to compete at a tougher level because they've got just really great rugby going up there. But uh, thank you both for coming on today. And, folks, thank you so much for watching us here on Rugby Saturday Southwest. Catch us again. Thank you.